here last week, you know that we started this sermon series for September, uh, Jonah, Man on the Run. Last week, Jonah chapter 1, we looked at Jonah running from God. Running from God. I want to give you a heads up that next week we're going to be in Jonah chapter 3, running with God. Today we're going to focus on Jonah chapter 2, running to God. Running to God. Last week, Jonah chapter 1, running from God. And basically, just to review Jonah chapter 1, God said go, Jonah said no. I mean a blatant no, I'm not going to do that. And so instead of running... And headed toward Nineveh, where God wanted him to go, he said no, and he headed to Tarshish. The the exact opposite direction, and as far as he could possibly think of going. So long story short, he jumps on a ship in the open sea. The Lord sends a storm. It almost wrecks the ship. Jonah realizes the storm's his fault. Just throw me overboard. Everything will be fine. They throw him overboard. Everything got fine. And then, um, you know, a fish swallows him. You know the story. Jonah, chapter 1. And what we learned last week, loud and clear, that if you decide to run from the Lord, you decide to say no to God, and you run from the Lord, you will be running toward regret. Your life's going to start unraveling. And you're going to hurt everyone around you. Jonah chapter 1. Now the good news of Jonah chapter 1, if you remember, that God got involved in the details, right? The good news is, yeah, you can run from the Lord, but you can't hide from him. And uh, the Lord got involved in the details of his life. In fact, Something you probably ought to know. Um, The Lord may even wreck your ship on occasion. Not to pay you back, but to bring you back. Remember? Jonah chapter 1. And so last week we ended the sermon leaving Jonah in the belly of a fish. Jonah chapter 1 verse 17. Look at this. Here's where we ended chapter 1. Verse 1, or chapter 1 verse 17. And the Lord provided, here we go. It's up there somewhere. Jonah chapter 1, the Lord provided a great fish, right? To swallow Jonah, and he was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. There it is. Now I know. Some of you have a really hard time believing this story. I want you to know that I believe this was a real story for two reasons. The first reason I believe that this is a real story is because Jesus believed it was a real story. Look at Matthew chapter 12. I think it starts with verse 39. Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation keeps looking for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was in was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. There's your sign. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment and with this generation condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now someone greater than Jonah has arrived. The first reason why I believe this, you know, fish tale, you know, this story of Jonah is a real story is because Jesus believed it. The second reason I believe this is a real story is that I worship and serve and love a really big God. Our God created the whole universe with a word. He spoke it into existence. That's pretty big. He resurrects the dead. Seriously. I think God can create a fish big enough to swallow Jonah, and I think he can keep him alive for three days if he wanted to. Right? Right? That's nothing to our God. And so we leave him in the uh, belly of the whale. One of my favorite stories, 
my favorite stories is of a girl, a little girl, and she's at school and they're in a classroom and, and they're talking, they happen to be talking about whales. And she just blurts out, oh, whales. Oh man, I love whales. In fact, my favorite Bible story is about a whale, Jonah and the whale. And the teacher's like, well, well listen, honey, there's no way that that can be true. It's not a real story. Because it's proven that whales can't open their mouths wide enough to swallow a person. And the little girl said, yeah, but the Bible says Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Honey, there's, I know you've heard this story. There's no way it can be true. It's impossible for a whale to open its mouth big enough to swallow a person. And in frustration, the little girl just kind of said, well, listen, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah all about it. And the teacher responded, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? To which she retorted, well, then you ask him. <laughs> oh. I love that little girl. But really, think about it. If our God cannot create a fish big enough to swallow Jonah and keep him alive for three days as he thinks about his life, how, on the, how in the world is he going to resurrect your soul? Just saying. That's Jonah 1. Let's go to Jonah 2 today. Here's how it starts out. Verse 1 from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Finally, finally, the preacher starts to pray. From inside the fish. Now, if you remember Jonah chapter 1, <laughs> Jonah's not praying. He refuses to pray. In fact, when you read Jonah chapter 1, the captain of the ship, which, by the way, is a pagan man, comes to Jonah, wakes him up, begs him, get up, start praying to your God. Maybe he'll save us. Even then, Jonah refused. Hmm. And you know as well as I do, when you're running from the Lord, he's the last person you want to talk to. Right? That's Jonah chapter 1. But finally... Chapter 2, verse 2, he's, the preacher starts to pray. All right, that's good. Good start. Look at verse 2. I love what's communicated here. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me from deep in the realm of the dead. I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Here's what I love about verse 2, and, and, and this is postable, all right? The miracle prayer is not in my talking. It's in his hearing. The miracle prayer is not in our talking to him. It's in the fact that he listens to us. There's the miracle of prayer. I love verse 2. Uh, verse uh, 3. Uh, he continues the prayer. Look at this. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Look at verse four, uh, 5 and 6. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever, but you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. I want to zero in on verse 7 through 10, and there's, this is where we're going to focus today. What happens in these next four verses are incredible. This is so good. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I vowed, I will make good, I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And then my favorite verse of the chapter... 
and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah on dry land. Ah. Jonah chapter 2 is all about Jonah running to God. You get that, right? You see that, right? It's all about Jonah running to God. Now in chapter 1, it was all about him running from God. And here's what I want you to know today. Um, one of those two options is true of you right now where you sit. I mean, right now, on the spot, right now, where you sit, right now, in real time, you are either living a Jonah chapter 1 life, or you're living a Jonah chapter 2 life. You are either running from the Lord, far from the Lord, or, or you're running closer to Him. Right now, on the spot. You are, you are either in chapter one or chapter two. The cool thing is we get to choose the path. We get to choose the path. And obviously here at the crossing, we want to encourage every one of you to be chapter two people. We want to encourage every one of you to be running to the Lord. And here's, here's what I love about chapter two. Jonah wants us, Jonah wants, wants us to understand two things about running to God. Two things today he wants us to get, understand, and to rest in as we run to the Lord. Two things. First is this. Running to the Lord starts and is, is sustained in prayer. I want you to know that running to the Lord starts and is sustained in our prayers. Jonah's repentance, his turnaround mark in life was when he started to pray. Prayer is so important. Prayer is so huge for the Christ follower. Prayer needs to be a top priority for everyone wanting to live a life, a chapter two life. Anyone wanting to live a life that is described as running to the Lord. Prayer is so essential. In fact, can I say to you today that your prayer life is the biggest indicator of whether or not you're running from him or to him. Your prayer life is the biggest indicator of whether you're going this way or, or that. Now, just for a quick moment, don't get stuck there, but just for a quick moment, I want you to think about your prayer life this past week. Is it communicating this way or that way? I mean, if we were to observe your whole prayer life, uh, it, it, w did you have any prayer this past week? If not, odds are you're running. From something, you know, from the Lord in, in something. But, but if you can honestly say, you know what? My life is so full and rich of conversation with the Lord. I'm, I'm praying. Pretty good indicator. You're running. But the truth is right now, it's either this way or this way. I love this prayer of Jonah. I absolutely love this prayer of Jonah. In fact, uh, there are four components of this prayer that make it such a great prayer. I want to share the four components of prayer that make this one such a great prayer. And, I, you know, it, it's four components. I'd love for you to add to your prayer life as you run to him. The first component is um, what I call truthful reflection. Truthful reflection. Truthful reflection. I mean, he's in the belly of a fish. And how long was he there? What could you do inside the belly of a fish for three days? You know what the Lord was doing? Stopping him. So he could think about things. Stopping him so he could think about his own life. Think about and reflect on his own actions and the consequences. To think about his own life. And it was out of that place he starts to pray. And, and it's, it's a place of truthful reflection. It's an honest confession. I want you to zero in on verse 8. Check this out. Verse 8. 
Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Now, at first glass, glance, that doesn't seem to fit. Does it? I mean, he's praying. He's having confession. And he just kind of blurts out this to those who cling to worthless idols, turn away from God's wrath. And I'm like, oh, now you want to preach. That sounds like a sermon, right? Now, Jonah, you want to preach. Nah, bro, this is not a sermon. This is a confession. This is, a, this is his confession. This is how he describes what he just went through. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. He realized that's exactly what he did. And Jonah's realizing that when you run from God, you run from God, you're running to something else that's idolatry. And Jonah knows that when you are going to say no to God, you're going to say yes to something else. That's idolatry. This is a confession. Prayer is our conversation with the Lord. Prayer is our confession of our heart to the Lord. Even Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, even in prayer. That's, verse eight is his description of what he just went through in this past season of life, running. And I call this truthful reflection. I hope your prayers are the result of some great truthful reflection. Which leads to a second component right there in the beginning of verse 9. But I with shouts of grateful praise. There's the second component. Grateful praise. See, there's going to be truthful reflection from our heart to him, right? Truthful, honest confession. And then it's going to lead to grateful praise. Grateful praise to our God. For, for his grace, for who he is, for what he's done, for what he's doing, for what he promises to do. Grateful praise. Now, I'm not going to linger on this point because I'm pretty convinced every one of us in this audience know that our prayers to our God ought to be filled with praise and thanksgiving. Amen? I mean, David commanded us in Psalm 100, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with, you know it. And Jonah records, and I with shouts of grateful praise. will sacrifice to you. There's the third component. Personal surrender. Personal surrender. I will sacrifice to you. I will give of myself to you. I will give all of me to you. I'm yours. Lord, I'm yours. Hey, when's the last time in your prayer life you just simply told the Lord, I'm yours. All that I am. Everything that I've got, I'm yours, Lord. Isn't this a good prayer? Out of truthful reflection, right? Grateful praise, personal surrender. And then look at the last part of verse 9 for the fourth component. The last part of verse 9 says, What I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. I call this one missional commitment. Missional commitment. All right, Lord, I'm with you. I'm yours. And I'm going to do what you want. He, he, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, what I vowed, I'm going to make good. I'm going to do what I told you I would do. I'll go preach. Hmm. Missional commitment. I'm ready to do what God wants me to do now. What was his vow? Basically, all right, I'll do what you want. I'll go where you want me to go, Lord. I'm ready. I'm in. I'm yours. Here I am. Send me. What's next? Wherever you want me to go. And, and then here's what's really cool. It was, it was from that prayer. 
you know, from that truthful time of reflection, you know, what else was he going to do inside, inside the fish? You know, he got it. And then grateful praise. He, he brought to God grateful praise. And then personal surrender. I'm yours, Lord. I'm all right, I'll go. Missional commitment. And it was out of that prayer, we are hurled toward verse 10, pun intended. And my favorite verse of the, of the chapter, verse 10. The Lord committed to the fish and it vomited Jonah on dry, dry land. I just think it's so cool that the Bible uses the word vomit. Don't you? This is real life. And Jonah was saved. Jonah was saved. He was saved from the storm. He was saved from the sinking ship. He was saved from the belly of the big fish. He was saved from his sin of going in the wrong direction. He was saved. Now he smelled absolutely disgusting. But he was saved. Here's the second thing Jonah wants you to know from chapter 2. Running to God, running to the Lord starts in prayer. And running to the Lord secures your salvation. Every one of you know that we're all guilty of running from the Lord. Everyone in this place is so guilty, so guilty. You, you even know what we deserve. We've all run from him. We've all lived in chapter one. But in God's grace, he offers second chances. But God, out of his grace, wants to save. And here's the truth of Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. When you <laughs> repent and you turn around and you surrender yourself to the Lord, you just, I'm yours, whatever you want, I'm yours. He's got you. And, and we're saved. Isn't that awesome? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be known for my running from God. I want to be known for running to God. Now, we're all guilty of running from him, but that's not, let's not let that characterize us. Let it, let it be running to him. Now, here's the assumption. Jonah's a preacher. He's an Old Testament prophet. The assumption for anybody who can encounter Jonah is he's good. He is right with the Lord. In fact, he's probably running to the Lord every day. Chapter 1 of Jonah indicates that is not the case. Far from it. I mean, it was the first episode of Fast and Furious. He was not right with the Lord. And here's the assumption today. You're sitting in church in the first hour the assumption is you're good the assumption is you're right with the lord the, the assumption is you're running to him every day that may not be the case but the truth of one of the options is very real either you are living right now right where you sit even in church you are either living a chapter one life or a chapter two life. You're either running from God in an area of your life or you're running to him in all areas of life. Every person you meet this week is either running from him or to him. But what about you right now? Here's the good news of the gospel. If your heart is pointed away from the Lord, if your heart has been running from him in any area of life, if your heart is pointing in a direction it not be pointing, guess what? Here's the good news. You can just turn it around. Just take your heart and point it to Jesus. And start running to him. 
And a great place to start is your prayer life. 